Chapter Two of the Comic History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden in honor of Jim Mowat's completion of his university degree in history. The Comic History of England by Bill Nye. Chapter Two: The Various Roman Yokes, Their Growth, Degeneration, and Final Elimination. Agricola no doubt made the Roman yoke easier upon the necks of the conquered people, and suggested the rotation of crops. He also invaded Caledonia, and captured quite a number of Scotchmen, whom he took home and domesticated. Afterwards, in 121 A.D., the emperor Hadrian was compelled to build a wall to keep out the still unconquered Caledonians. This is called the Pix Wall, and a portion of it still exists. Later, in 208 A.D., Severus built a solid wall of stone along this line, and for seventy years there was peace between the two nations. Towards the end of the third century, Carausius, who was appointed to the thankless task of destroying the Saxon pirates, shook off his allegiance to the emperor Diocletian, joined the pirates, and turned out Diocletian, usurping the business management of Britain for some years. But, alas, he was soon assassinated by one of his own officers before he could call for help, and the assassin succeeded him. In those days assassination and inauguration seemed to go hand in hand. After Constantius, who died 306 A.D., came Constantine the Great, his son by a British princess. Under Constantine peace again reigned, but the Irish, who desired to free Ireland even if they had to go abroad and neglect their business for that purpose, used to invade Constantine's territory, getting him up at all hours of the night, and demanding that he should free Ireland. These men were then called Picts, hence the expression, Picked Men. They annoyed Constantine by coming over and trying to introduce home rule into the home of the total stranger. The Scots also made turbulent times by harassing Constantine and seeking to introduce their ultra-religious belief at the muzzle of the cross-gun. Trouble now came in the latter part of the 4th century A.D., caused by the return of the regular Roman army, which went back to Rome to defend the imperial city from the Goths, who sought to stable their stock in the palace of the Caesars, as the historian so tersely puts it. In 418 A.D., the Roman forces came up to London for the summer, and repelled the Scots and Picts, but soon returned to Rome, leaving the provincial people of London with disdain. Many of the Roman officers, while in Britain, had their clothes made in Rome, and some even had their linen returned every thirty days and washed in the Tiber. In 446 A.D., the Britons were extremely unhappy. The barbarians throw us into the sea, and the sea returns us to the barbarians, they ejaculated in their petition to the conquering Romans. But the latter were too busy fighting the Huns to send troops, and, in desperation, the Britons formed an alliance with Hengist and Horsa, two Saxon travelling men who, in 449 A.D., landed on the island of Thanet, and thus ended the Roman dominion over Britain. The Saxons were at that time a coarse people. They did not allow etiquette to interfere with their methods of taking refreshment, and, though it pains the historian at all times to speak unkindly of his ancestors who have now passed on to their reward, he is compelled to admit that as a people the Saxons may be truly characterized as a great national appetite. During the palmy days, when Rome superintended the collecting of customs and regulated the formation of corporations, the mining and smelting of iron were extensively carried on, and the walking delegate was invented. The accompanying illustration shows an ancient strike. Rome no doubt did much for England, for at that time the imperial city had 384 streets, 56,567 palaces, 80 golden statues, 2,785 bronze statues of former emperors and officers, 41 theaters, 2,291 prisons, and 2,300 perfumery stores. She was in the full flood of her prosperity, and had about four million inhabitants. In those days a Roman senator could not live on less than eighty thousand dollars per year, and Marcus Antonius, who owed one point five million dollars on his inaugural, March 15, paid it up by March 17, 
and afterwards cleared seven hundred and twenty million dollars. This he did by the strictest economy, which he managed to have attended to by the peasantry. Even a literary man in Rome could amass property, and Seneca died worth twelve million dollars. Those were the flush times in Rome, and England no doubt was greatly benefited thereby. But, alas, money matters became scarce, and the poor Briton was forced to associate with the delirium tremens and massive digestion of the Saxon, who floated in a vast ocean of lard and wassail during his waking hours, and slept with the cunning little piglets at night. His earthen floors were carpeted with straw and frescoed with bones. Let us not swell with pride as we refer to our ancestors, whose lives were marked by an eternal combat between malignant alcoholism and trichinosis. Many a Saxon would have filled a drunkard's grave, but wobbled so in his gait that he walked past it and missed it. To drink from the skulls of their dead enemies was a part of their religion, and there were no heretics among them. Footnote A. The artist has very ably shown here a devoted little band of Saxons holding services in abasement, in referring to it as abasement, not the slightest idea of casting contumely or obloquy on our ancestors is intended by the humble writer of pungent but sometimes unpalatable truth. End footnote. Christianity was introduced into Britain during the second century, and later, under Diocletian, the Christians were greatly persecuted. Christianity did not come from Rome, it is said, but from Gaul. Among the martyrs in those early days was St. Alban, who had been converted by a fugitive priest. The story of his life and death is familiar. The Bible had been translated, and in 314 A.D. Britain had three bishops, that is, of London, Lincoln, and York. End of chapter 2